All right, good morning. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, we've been working with scaffolds for the last 15 years, uh, part of my PhD at Ohio State, and looking at different things from vascular grafts to soft tissue meshes, and uh, so it's nice to present some of our work here in the rotator cuff. And uh, so to get to um, where we are today, let's take a quick look back of, of where we've been from 100 years ago of doing uh, open repairs, and then here more recently, 30 years of, of arthroscopic repairs. Uh, and, and the evolution of anchors to the evolution of, of surgical techniques and, and what we're going to progress to here is evolution of scaffolds. And so I'm sure all of you guys have seen these couple of papers by Ayanade and, and going through the different trends of scaffolds and advances from all the different dermises, allografts and, and xenografts and cross-linking and uncross-linking. And then there at the bottom you can start to see some of these synthetic grafts coming into play. So when we, we look at this progression of, of scaffolds and techniques, these allografts and xenografts are, are the primary players and being used in an overlay position. So the overlay, we're putting this big beefy graph on. Uh, it's going to increase the strength of repair at the time of, of surgery, and it's going to help avoid suture pullout over time. But what we're seeing over time is that it's not really impacting this bone to tendon healing. And so if we look at augmenting the thickness of tendons, we're, we're not truly impacting how that tendon is reattaching back into the bone. And we can see this, this evolution progressing now. This paper just came out from Colorado State looking at this interpositional resorbable graft. And there's a, a schematic here. You can see a little tongue flap coming out from the anchor. This graft is, is resorbable and placed in this inlay position. And so this is the sort of the progression or the future of scaffolds and you can see being placed in between the bone and the tendon. This is uh, not improving the strength at all at day zero. It's not gonna improve suture pullout strength, but what we're starting to see here is this improvement in bone tendon healing, and they show about a 25% increase in this breaking strength uh, at a 12-week time point in the sheet model. So the, the question is, you know, if we look at all these different evolutions from surgical techniques, anchors, uh, suture techniques, are we improving outcomes, are we improving healing? And, you know, we see all these papers with publishing failure rates from 10% to 90%, uh, and so there's, there's room for improvement. So what, what we've done with rhodium is, is our interpositional resorbable graft. So this is uh, sort of anchor friendly, it's a Switzerland of, of graft, so it's compatible with all of the, the sutures and anchor types out there and it's being used in an inlay position. So on top of the bone, underneath of the tendon, uh, and there's really no special equipment or, or tools required to do this. If we zoom in and look at the structure of, of our scaffold compared to native tendon, you can see that your body is comprised of this native extracellular matrix, typically uh, fibrous collagens, and, and our scaffold here on the left is mimicking that same structure from uh, uh, morphology standpoint, but we're using synthetic polymers, the same things that are used in resorbable sutures. We call it a resorbable wick uh, because it, it wicks up biologic material. So if, if you or your patients like PRP or bone marrow aspirate, stromal vascular fraction, this, this graft will actively wick that up and hold it at the site of repair. It's also pulling this material up from the anchor holes, so fenestrated anchors, and we're pulling bone marrow up from those anchor holes as well. So here's Dr. Mile and some residents putting this in. This is a, an example. There's there's a hundred ways to put this in, but they're they're passing a suture needle through there and passing the fiber tapes. We'll zoom in there, and you can see this uh, up closer. You can use it with one anchor or two anchors. Uh, it, you can skew it a little medially or laterally to co help cover the footprint. So once you pass those fiber tapes through, we're going to shuttle it down through the cannula. Typically we're just folding it, grasping it with some forceps and sliding it down through. And then you can see it coming down here on your repair site. And then simply going to lay it open and then repair as normal. So in general, it should add one to, to two minutes to procedure time. So 
So <clears throat> when we look at the design and the function of this graph, the first thing we like to do is just look at simple in vitro experiments. So when we look at synovial stem cells and chondrocyte adhesion, we're going to compare this to a, a collagen scaffold like Regenitin. Uh, and here in this simple test, TCP is tissue culture polystyrene. Everything grows extremely well on, on plastic petri dishes. Uh, but when we look at the, the collagen graph, the Regenitin and our rhodium graph, you can see we're, we're almost doubling the proliferation rate of these synovial stem cells and chondrocytes on this graft. We repeated this here in triplicate on the, the graft on the right, and so we're, we're almost doubling proliferation rates in vitro. We look at something uh, that has been around a little bit longer, something like graft jacket that is, is not as conducive to this sort of rapid growth uh, and proliferation. Do the same thing, we, we cut the scaffolds up, put them into polystyr polystyrene culture dishes, and then look at proliferation. In this case, we're using primary uh, human mesenchymal stem cells, tenocytes, and osteoblasts. And here, we're, we're typically tripling the proliferation rate of these cells. So in these simple, well-controlled, well-defined experiments, we're, we're dramatically improving cell attachment and cell proliferation. So now, what, what does that mean in vivo? So working with Dr. Romeo and the, the Colorado State team out there, we implemented this acute rotator cuff study, uh, the same study that was just recently published, and, and our data will be published here shortly. But this is the, the outcome at 12 weeks. So when, when we look at the six-week time point, we saw a 33% increase in breaking strength, and by 12 weeks, we were up at 75% increase. So this is, this is ultimate failure. We're pulling the shoulder apart, looking at that ultimate failure. When we look at the, um, the control group, and this is just uh, the swivel lock anchors in a speed bridge fashion without the rhodium scaffold, you can see these huge air bars. And this is, this is not a mistake. This is with 40 sheep total in this group. And what you can see is that some of these animals healed at almost an uninjured level, and some of them healed at like a 20 Newton breaking strength level. So extremely weak, and you see these huge air bands. And I think that's representing what we see in these publications when we see 10 to 90% failure rates on some of our patients. These sheep walk out of the OR, and I think that's something that, that we don't appreciate, that these sheep have no physical therapy regime. They walk out, and they're immediately in the pasture. So anything we can do to help improve the consistency of repair uh, in sheep or ultimately in our patients has very dramatic effects. So if you look at our air bars and, and the tightness of that, so when we zoom in and then look at the histology, this image on the left shows the typical bone and then the tendon coming back down on top of that. Uh, this is with anchors only. The image on the right shows this purple and black band in between the bone and the tendon. And these are what we call Sharpie fibers. This is the native attachment of that tendon back into the bone. So our scaffold has been the only scaffold to show this in these acute studies. Uh, and this is evident on the mechanical testing as well, one with the ultimate breaking strength, but two, when we pull these shoulders apart, the control tendons simply pop off. There, there's no integration. And when we pull our shoulders apart, it's, it's like Velcro. You can feel and hear the tendons tearing these Sharpie fibers back out of the bone. So we, we went one extra step in, in working with Colorado State and Dr. Romeo here. We have been implementing this chronic model, and this is a little more indicative of what we see with, with humans. We injure these sheep, let that wound progress for six weeks, and then we go in and do the repair. So instead of an acute cut on the infraspinatus, now we're going to do two types of damage here. And so one is abbreviated CF, this is a combed fenestration, another one is abbreviated ST, sharp transection. So we're, we're cutting 50% of the footprint, letting that fester for six weeks, and then repairing. In this case, these models are much tougher than the acute repair where you have fresh, healthy uh, bone and tendon being joined back together. This is now six weeks of, of chronicity going in here. And now compared to the anchor only for the comb fenestration, we've nearly doubled the repair strength on this test. And when we look at the sharp transection, now we're almost at 600% uh, improvement over that. So really dramatic on these much harsher models that don't typically heal without something, some sort of scaffold to help spur that regeneration process. 
So it, once again, if we zoom in and look at the histology, the image on the left is a control uh, anchor only repair. And you can see these fatty scar tissue deposits between the bone and the tendon. And the repair on the right is with our rhodium scaffold reinstituting those Sharpie fibers. So just to, to wrap up here and summarize, in the last 30 years, we've had a lot of improvements, anchors, surgical techniques, not a lot of improvement on the healing outcomes. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's, there's two groups of people. There, there's scaffold people and there's non-scaffold people. And hopefully the, some of the data I showed you today can, can help skew that group towards the scaffold people uh, and starting to see what that can do with some of your patient populations. Uh, there's, there's a need to put a scaffold at that site of injury and help hold the biological melu there at the site of injury and not on top of the tendon, but, but where you want that healing to occur. And a lot of scaffolds have some extreme costs uh, that might put them out of place for surgery centers. And so cost is a very sensitive subject. Uh, and so happy to talk more about scaffolds and materials and costs uh, out at our booth. And um, so with that, thank you and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Johnson about the scaffold, Mark? Oh, um, that was great. Really interesting. So one of the things that we were in, involved in that BioWick study, and one of the things that had been perpetuated was that the wick should be inside the bone. So first question is, how much bony preparation you think you need to do to enhance the integration of the stem cells into the material? Um, the second question is, you showed, uh, and I didn't pick up on this earlier, but it's pretty clever, actually. But you showed one technique where all the sutures went through one portion of the rhodium, and then they passed through the cuff. So my question is, why would you not consider having that skull scaffold with multiple sutures in your, hor in your medial row pass through that and then pass through the cuff? Because then you do get perhaps a mechanical benefit, as you demonstrated with the onlay graft uh, uh, method. Thank you. So good, good questions. The, the bone preparation, we're typically decorticating down to sort of the paprika surface, so where we just start to see the blood flow, uh, crimson duvet. So decorticating so we have that active blood supply there. And on some of our arthroscopic pictures, you can see blood and the marrow wicking into the scaffold, even under flow and pressure uh, from the arth arthroscopic setting. So it's, it's wicking that material up, whether you put it on outside of the body or not. And then second question, the, the rhodium scaffold, if you pull on it, is not mechanically robust enough to really provide suture retention strength. So, you know, it has enough mechanical integrity to be passed down through a cannula, and you can, you can perforate it with a couple of anchors, but not enough to really reinforce tissue like that. Great questions. Any other questions or comments from anyone? No? Well, thank you very much. Great presentation.